And the title of my talk actually is a, is a research proposal which uh, has been highlighted for full submission by the Leverhulme Trust. And uh, it means uh, basically I'm working on methods to do simulations of uh, systems, against better systems, molecules, atoms, and these things, very much more efficient than we can do it today. Uh, so I think to make you understand the scale of what's happening in physics at the moment, I, I think I have to give you a visit to so theoretical physics in the 20th century. Don't worry, I don't uh, use any equations. You could only take me five minutes. And uh, to understand theoretical physics in the 20th century, you have to realize that it was developed by mathematicians. All of them. They called themselves physicists, but they were really mathematicians. Now, what does that mean? Basically, they worked like mathematicians would do. They start off with the axiom. Then they slowly develop the elements of their structures, find them, invent them, whatever. Then after that, they uh, define the interactions between these elements. In this, uh, uh, in this, at this point, they typically introduce uh, conservation principles or symmetry considerations, and there might be the one or the other differential equation. Right? So then they have their mathematical structure, but now their colleagues said to them, well, you are physicists. What has that to do with the real world? And they said, well, hang on a minute, and they invented a new trick. And the trick was that uh, mathematical objects could create physical objects, okay? Uh, you see that in equations, on the left-hand side, you have a mathematical object, on the right-hand side, you have a physical object. I can give you three names for the three prime suspects. One is Werner Heisenberg, second one is Max Born, the third one is Wolfgang Born. Now, if you think about that, it's logically problematic, but it also makes uh, uh, theoretical physics very inefficient. And the reason for that is, if you, for example, then have many electrons in the system, as I would do as a, as a condensed matter theorist, then you have to have a separate coordinate system for every electron, because you want to have the most general description of the system. So then your coordinates blow up, the description becomes extremely uh, involved, and you do all that because you don't understand what's happening in real space. Uh, if you understand what's happening in real three-dimensional space, you can get rid of all this uh, overhead, and you can do it much more efficiently. And then you can go and simulate it. So, that's where we are at the moment. Let me give you some brief history, how this came about. I'm gonna compare with the standard model. I keep that short because you're not a physicist, so you probably won't appreciate the subtleties of my approach here. Uh, then uh, I give you what we do in many body physics, and at the end I give a proof of principle that this actually works, okay? And the summary will then sort of uh, highlight some, some key points. So I had two crucial questions which actually led to this research, which I've been pursuing for the last 10 years or so. And the first question was, why do electrons change their wavelengths when they change their velocity? This is something a standard theory can't answer. And I asked this question in 2009, and I found an answer on the airplane from uh, Paris to Beijing. And the answer is, you have to have two densities. You have to have a spin density, and you have to have a mass of charge density. Typically, in the standard formulation, we operate with only one density. That's called uh, density function theory. And uh, if you look at that, then you know that the density we use in density function theory is a sum of two separate densities. One the spin density, and the other one the mass density. So that was question one, and that led to a couple of papers. This is the first one I wrote on this uh, problem. Uh, it was in 2010. It's quite a long one. And it's a very technical one. <coughs> Mathematicians will appreciate it. Physicists probably as well. I'm not sure you computer scientists will do that. And the second one uh, I wrote in 2012, where I looked at uh, electron densities on metal surfaces and how we measure them. And there I found that essentially the Heisenberg uncertainty relations are violated by a of about 100 in these measurements. And they are done routinely every day in about 100 to 1,000 laps a month. But that was this uh, uh, problem solved, or question answered. And the second question was, uh, are triangles real? And now I hadn't asked this question as a dean. I was standing on my desk in the, in the faculty office. <laughs> Kirsty Steed was opposite me. And I said, Kirsty, are triangles real? She said, yes, they are. And I said, no, they are not. Because triangles are mathematical objects, and therefore they are not real. So they, they exist in their own space in mathematical space. And then uh, you can go back to something Isidore Labi said in 1985 about quantum theory. He said, the problem is that the theory is too strong, too compelling. I feel we are missing the basic point. The next generation, so that's us, as soon as they will have found that point, will knock on their heads and say, how could they have missed it? 
what they've missed, I will explain to you now, is essentially that uh, quantum mechanics and all following theories are based on patients. They're not really fun. So, now we have two different spaces. We have mathematical space on the left, and we have real three dimensional space on the right. There are objects in these spaces, and they are different. So, in mathematical space, triangles are objects <coughs> in mathematical space, matrices are objects in mathematical space, wave functions, spins, operators, finals, part, most particles, and strings of things. So, those are mathematical objects. Then in real three-dimensional space, this is what I'm talking about when I talk as a physicist, we have physical objects, their densities, their masses, the momenta, the energies, magnetic moments, electromagnetic fields, and gravitational fields. Those are all physical objects and they all contain energy and momentum. And the key difference is that objects in mathematical <coughs> space are not physical objects. Whereas objects in real three-dimensional space are physical objects. So there's a key difference. So now if you look at the theoretical models, String theory, for example, exists only in mathematical space. It doesn't even cross the way into real three-dimensional space. All our classical physical models exist in real three-dimensional space. Classical mechanics exists, uh, classical electrodynamics, and it's a similar models. And the problem we had in the 20th century, we created theoretical models which cross over from mathematical space into real three-dimensional space. So the prime one is quantum mechanics, but after that they invented nuclear physics along the same lines. They used the same trick. Density functional theory, as it was originally formulated, is also existing in mathematics and real three-dimensional physics. And of course, high energy physics is one of the elements. So what I've done in my research, uh, the problem with that is that mathematics creates reality. Okay? That's not allowed. So what I've done in the last 10 years, I've moved density functional theory out uh, of mathematical space and completely into real three-dimensional space, which simplifies the problem a lot. You just have to know what's going on in your physical system. If you want to read up on uh, the arguments, they are in the, in the paper for the, for the test shift, but I also published them on the internet. And there you find the details of why we are in this predicament in theoretical physics. Of course, if you now look at it as, a, as an opportunity, then we might have to redevelop quite a lot of theoretical physics in the next 10 years. And we will have to do that also in the numerical methods, which then uh, build up on, on this new theory. And there's a, a huge opportunity for computer science, I think, to actually do something in physics in the next 10 years, which at the moment I think most computer scientists uh, uh, restrict themselves to either neuroscience or biology. I think physics is the way to go. Okay, so, <clears throat> I'm not sure you want to know this in great detail. Basically what, I, what I've done here is I've compared what the standard model says and what the new model says. So in the standard model, in the Stern-Gurlach experiment, that is where you measure the magnetic moment of atoms. You have uh, essentially a silver atom going through your system, and it uh, is uh, deflected by this uh, magnet here, this north and south, and it lands at two points up and down here. Okay? So you have two results of your measurement, and uh, the result is due, uh, the standard formulation says, to the spin of the atom. So then you ask yourself, what is spin? Spin is a vector because spin is affected by the magnetic field. It has the properties of magnetic moment and therefore it is a vector. Magnetic moments are vectors. But then if you rotate the uh, magnet, you get exactly the same uh, experiment, uh, ex uh, experimental outcome on different directions. So in this case, you have to say that it cannot be uh, the spin is a, a vector, it must be isotropic, and therefore it's not a vector. Okay, so you have a problem here. How can spin be isotropic before the measurement? And how does spin become a vector in the middle? And the only answer you get in the standard formulation is a couple of matrices, the so-called Pauli matrices, uh, which do the trick. So uh, you, you have these two vector matrices, you have the eigenvectors for, uh, from these matrices equations, and they act on spinners, and then you get the experimental results, which look like that. And you measure uh, one half of the uh, atoms over there, and one half of the atoms down here. And that's uh, what the standard theory says. Spin can have two values because the Pauli matrix is spanned in space from two dimensions in space. When the wave function collapses, and that's an important one, on the eigenvector, it means you have a definite result afterwards, but not before the measurement, which leads to two trajectories in the same direction. If you do consecutive measurements, then uh, <coughs> if you have the same axis P as uh, for the axis A, of course, you get the same result, uh, or the, the zero for the opposite one, and that is due to the mathematical form of the problem. 
But there's a problem with this explanation because uh, there's no physical explanation what the co collapse of the wave function actually means. And there's a host of theoretical speculations going back 60, 70 years by trying to account for this problem. And uh, I give a list here. And the problem with it is really there was no physical model which determines what we measure in these experiments. You just going back to the point uh, Alex raised in our discussions, you cannot really give the timeline of the experiment, so it happens here, then it does happen, then it happens and so on. It's impossible in this framework because you create your experimental results from a mathematical uh, there's an additional problem, and that is, um, was uh, uh, stated in the, in the 30s by Einstein, who was composing. There's a similar problem called the Schrodinger cat, cat paradox. You can also explain Einstein, who was the Rosen experiments. Uh, basically, what you have there is rotations and phases, and the correlations are not exactly the ones that you get when you uh, do your calculations. But in this case, as well, it's all in three dimensions. So the advantages, uh, spin has vector properties, properties and is isotropic. Sternberg experiments are explained in terms of cause and effect, which you can't do in the standard model. anti commutativity <coughs> spin elements is well understood, which you also can't do in the standard model. There's no spooky action in the distance of the experiments, and there's no need for any of the other fancy quantum mechanical concepts. Uh, this paper was published last year, and it shows uh, how this actually works. Okay, if we now go to many bodies, um, I'm not sure. Does anyone of you know uh, density functional theory? Heard of the term? Ever come across it? Okay, density functional theory is how most chemists and physicists today calculate the properties of many electron systems. Um, they are, for example, the Archer computer in Edinburgh, 50% of the calculations there are density function theory calculations. And uh, we all use it because uh, it's been developed over the last uh, 50 years. It, density is existing in real space, it's very efficient, and uh, there's probably hundreds of uh, professional tools out there which, which uh, allow to calculate stuff. So there's three different uh, implementations at the moment. The first one is uh, called the cohn sham formulation, that goes back to the 2060s, uh, by the Cohn and Lushan. And they basically uh, provided the standard method to do it. It is very accurate, but it has to use uh, auxiliary uh, orbitals to calculate the single electron, so it's very poor scale. So it scales with the number of electrons <coughs> in our And the, the limit, the hard limit at the moment with this method is probably about 10,000 electrons, roughly, which is not very large. Then there's all the MDFD, basically where you use a certain mathematical tricks to make it much more efficient, sparse matrices and things like that. That's linear scaling, so it scales with the number of electrons to the power of one. But it has approximations and therefore has a limited scope. Then there's uh, something which has been around for about 40 years, it's OPV3 BFD. It goes back to uh, the original theorem saying, oh, if I, all I need to know is the density, then I don't actually need my orbitals. So I can go from one density to the next, and that is then uh, linear scaling. But here the problem is with a very poor curse. Now with this method we have something with linear scaling, there are no orbitals, and it's potentially as accurate as function. Now if you do an estimate, and that's uh, in my target, if you do an estimate how big a system you could potentially get to, it's probably a micron. And a micron is the size of the bacteria. So we could actually go up with this method to the size of Theory. And that means we cut out the middleman in our uh, biological simulations at the moment because we can not only do it cost grain, we can do it with real physical methods. Okay, so I rattled through this uh, mathematical uh, framework just to show you that basically it's been thought through. So again, we have the base function 2.0, the effective one. We have an effective hemotonium, which has uh, the standard part, which is H0, and then we have a new part, which is called the bioactive potential. But this does, I will show you in a minute. And then we have sort of a matrix equation down here, uh, which is here, yeah, on the solution system that is landed. So we have like two different uh, densities here. We have the, the mass density and the spin density. This is uh, called the uh, chemical potential. It's basically a material property. And uh, you see that this <coughs> potential Vp crosses over from the, the uh, mass terms to the spin terms. So it gives you the interaction between those two. 
And that's uh, interesting, you know, as I was showing you, because it means it gives a completely different meaning to something we calculate at the moment. But it, it gives you the same uh, numerical results. So the bivector potential is VP couples uh, mass and spin density. Both are solutions of the same equation. It's the same thing. So then we have functional equations. You can get an explicit form for the bivector potential from mass and spin densities, and then the derivatives, which is also quite handy because that means you can, for every point of the system, depending on what the densities are, we know the potential. Uh, and then we can sort of minimize our energies as we do in the standard concham uh, like uh, formulation, and you get governing equations and so on and so forth. So it's all essentially doable. It's all doable with a relatively similar methods to the one we have at the moment. Only with one key difference, we only have mass and spin densities in nothing. Okay, so there's a self consistent solution we uh, looked at as we use in the moment in our calculations. Uh, there's no direct determinant equation, instead the direct determinant is like density and so on. And here this is for the, for the connoisseurs, there's a method called hartley fock method, we basically implemented it in a similar way, uh, this is the original one, we did a similar one for, for all two densities, it's all doable, so my postdoc has been working away on, on this for the last uh, two years or so, and we've even implemented the key parts of it in the conventional code called CASTEP, which is a conventional Mentioned at UFD code with about 5,000 users, I think, we about. So we can do that easily. And here I show you what we get with it. So here we calculated the hydrogen molecule. I have to, uh, have to emphasize here that there's no parallel. It's all coming from the new equations. It's all first principles. And it's all just coming out of the calculation. Right? And here I have three different results. I have the result. <coughs> For the Hartley Fock method, that's the standard result of quantum chemistry. We have the result of BFD, which is the standard result in the conventional theory. And the one we get is down here. Uh, and uh, so you see, we are actually, for the, for the bond length between the two hydrogens, we are actually in the same ballpark as both of those. So it's actually quite precise. But we can do more than that. So we use the, the, the code to calculate up to 10 electrons. So this is up here, so this is neon. And over there is this hydrogen. And you can see that it's very close to the Humphrey Fock results, which are sort of standard results in conventional theory. And it's a bit higher uh, than the BFD, but that's because we didn't include one part of the interaction between the electrons, uh, which we still have to do. Okay, so I think I'm actually through with my talk. So we have formulated a many body approach with input exchange effect in mass and spin densities. Correlation effect sets the energy uh, contribution is still this. We need to be included. The formulation is much simpler, and my colleagues, when, when I presented that to them, said uh, they're really surprised at how elegant <coughs> it is. It's really elegant, and you can do as many electron as you like. It's much simpler than present, it contains only four independent variables. It's free of uh, auxiliary assumptions, and even with the user like the for systems, so we key up to the larger systems now. So these uh, things actually have been uh, submitted and uh, the referee reports have been back and uh, this uh, support for the application, so it will be out probably later this year. And due to the theoretical simplification, the method is truly means getting much more efficient than the current standard. And the interaction energy between mass density and spin density has the same value as the exchange energy. So same value, completely different physical background uh, as, as uh, in the standard model that's where it's uh, exchange energy. But here we have the interactions between the two densities. But it gives you the same effect. And thank you very much. Thank you.